So now let's talk about chapter six in the PMBOK guide, project schedule management. Before I get started, let me mention that if you're interested, we have lots of free PMP prep materials at projectprep.org. We've got cheat sheets, full-length practice tests, note cards, lots of stuff that should be pretty helpful. So there's six process, uh, processes in this chapter. Five are in planning, one's in monitoring and controlling. So with plan schedule management, we're documenting how the schedule is going to be developed and controlled. We're estimating techniques are we're going to use, who we're going to have involved, that sort of thing. And then we're going to define activities, identifying steps required to produce the project deliverables. Now, when we talked about scope management, we created the, the work breakdown structure. And the lowest level of the WBS are work packages. And I like to think of those as nouns. Like if you're constructing a house, it's a roof, the foundation, the walls, uh, the plumbing. Now with activities, we're going to take that one step further and develop actions to complete those things. So example, with the, in the case of a roof, activities might be um, hiring a roofer, securing the materials, installing the roof, checking it for leaks, so on. Those could be activities. Oftentimes they start with a verb. At least that's the way I like to think of them. Then we're going to sequence activities after we define them. We're going to identify relationships or the order among those activities. And then we're going to estimate activity duration, so approximate how many work periods or how many days it's going to be needed to complete those activities. And then we're going to develop the schedule, so take all of the activity sequences, estimates, and so on, and create a schedule baseline. And then we're going to control the schedule over time, monitor activities, and manage changes to the schedule baseline. Now let's talk about sequencing activities. So remember, when we define activities, we have to make sure we sequence them in the right order. That's going to help us when we put together our schedule. Now sequencing involves identifying and documenting relationships or dependencies between activities. Because you can't do everything at the same time. There's a certain order that things have to go in. And every task, except for the first and last, should have both a uh, at least one predecessor and successor. And we'll talk about what those mean. And you can really do this manually, but um, it makes most sense to have a tool to help you do that, like Microsoft Project. And really what it does, the key benefit here, is it defines the logical sequence of work to get the greatest efficiency under constraints. So this is a diagram from the previous chapter. We're kind of adding to it here. So if we think about how we break out our project work, we break it out into deliverables, and then into work packages, and then into activities. And if we go back in time, we talked about how at least I like to think of work packages as nouns, and then in activities as verbs or steps. So there might be a work package that involves the roof, getting the roof installed. And the steps or activities to get that done might be to hire a contractor, buy the materials, install the roof, test it for leaks, and so on. Those are the individual activities. So after we de decompose the work into work packages and then activities, we have to put them in the right order. We have to sequence them. So here's the first thing that we need to know about sequences. A predecessor is a task that comes logically before another one. So a predecessor comes before a successor, which is a task that logically comes after another. And the way that I remember this is P comes before S in the English alphabet. So a predecessor comes before a successor, P before S. Here's an example of that. If I have to, or when I, washing my car, that could be a predecessor. And a successor, a task that could come after that, would be to wax it. We don't want to wax the car before we wash it. This is the order that we need to go in. Kind of building on that, let's talk about the precedence diagramming method. It's a way to sequence our activities. And there's four different relationships that are talked about with PDM or the precedence diagramming method. There's finish to start, finish to finish, start to start, and start to finish. So let me give you examples of those. So here's finish to start. A race must finish before the award ceremony can start. So there's the sequence. We have to finish the race, and at the end of the race, after it's done, we can start the award ceremony. We can't start the award ceremony before the race finish. It doesn't make sense. This is a finish to start relationship. And there could be a finish to finish relationship. This is where if we're writing a document, we must finish writing it before the editing can finish. It's a finish to finish. We can't um, finish editing 
before the writing is done. It doesn't make any sense. We gotta wait till the writing is finished before we can finish editing. There's a finish to finish relationship. And then there's a start to start. Maybe you can't start leveling concrete until you start pouring it. That's a start to start relationship. Something has to start before you can start another. And then there's also a start to finish. So think about it this way. Once the second security guard starts, the first guard can finish. There's just, that's a start to finish relationship. Really probably the most common uh, relationship is finish to start, the first one that we looked at. Let's talk a little bit more about dependencies and relationships between activities. When we're determining dependencies, there's really four types. There's mandatory dependencies, discretionary, external, and internal. So this might help us understand the, pro the, the appropriate sequence of activities. So a mandatory dependency is something that's legally required. It has to be done in a certain order. Then there's discretionary dependencies. You put things in, the, in a certain order because it's really best practice. It doesn't mean you have to do it, but it's a good idea. That's discretionary. Then there's external dependencies, things that are usually outside of the project team's control. Maybe it's um, there's an external government requirement to do things in a certain sequence or order. Maybe you have to, um, and this is a government requirement perhaps, to lay the foundation of your building before you can stand up the walls. And what's interesting here is that that type of dependency can be both mandatory, so it's legally required, and external. So they can be a combination of these. Then there's internal dependencies, things that are inside of the project team's control. For example, if the team cannot test a machine until they assemble it, this is an internal mandatory dependency. It's something that's inside the team's control. External is outside, like a government requirement. Okay, now let's take a look at a mandatory dependency, an example of that. So here's something that you have to do. It's not possible, really, to do it in a, a different way. So when you're constructing a home, you must lay the foundation before you can build the walls. It's mandatory. It's got to be done that way. Then there's discretionary still thinking about a home, you should paint it before you install the appliances. It doesn't mean you have to do it that way, but it's a good idea. It becomes a lot easier to paint if you haven't yet installed your appliances. And then here's an external dependency. You must get a permit before you can start construction. That's an example. There's an outside or external group requiring something or a certain sequence of activities. Then there's internal dependencies. Here's an example. You must install electric wiring, electric wiring before you can turn on or install your appliances. That's really something that's required internal to your project team. It may not be an external requirement. Okay, now we're still talking about sequencing. Let's talk about the concepts of leads and lags. So leads are the amount of time that a successor can be advanced. And a lag is the amount of time a successor can be delayed or will be delayed. Let me give you an example of this. So let's say you're preparing a contract. You're writing a contract. Here's an example of a lag. And this would be a start to start relationship plus a lag. Once we start writing the contract, we have to wait 15 days and then we can begin editing. So we have to wait to get started. It's a lag. There's a wait there. So we can't, uh, so once we start writing, we have to wait 15 days until we can start editing. There's a lag there. It has to, to, to wait. Here's another example. Once we finish editing, or finish writing, excuse me, we wait 15 days and then can begin editing. If that's what we've got to do, that's an example of a lag. There's a wait there. After you finish writing, you wait 15 days. So we're waiting to start something again. Here's an example of a lead. This is a lead into something. 15 days before we finish writing, we can begin editing. So it's kind of changing the previous example a bit. This is still a finish to start relationship, but we can start 15 days early. We can advance the successor activity. So we can start editing before writing is finished. So the way that this is represented, if this is a finish to start relationship, which it is, we say finish to start minus 15. 
So we can start 15 days early. We can get ahead. Okay, now what we're going to do is take these sequences in relationships and dependencies and put together project schedule network diagrams. So this is the output of sequence activities, the process sequence activities. It's a graphical uh, representation of relationships among these activities. And it's usually produced using project management software, and you may have a narrative to kind of accompany the diagram. So here's an example of one of these project schedule network diagrams. It shows you the order or sequence of activities and if there's any leads or lags. So in all, in all cases, these are finished to start relationships. But if you look at the bottom of this diagram, in between C and E, so the way that this works is this is actually a lag because we see plus 15. So C, uh, excuse me, once C is finished, we have to wait 15 days and then E can start. So on a project schedule network diagram, it's going to show you these relationships. And another common visualization of your schedule is a Gantt chart. This gets used a lot. Now here's an example of using the critical path method with these project schedule network diagrams. Now this is showing you that uh, there's two paths through the project, and the critical path is A, C, and D. The critical path is the longest path through the project. And what it's showing you here is if you look at the top of each rectangle in the middle, for example, for A, uh, the one in the middle is 5, the top in the middle, that's the duration, how long the activity is expected or estimated to take, 5 days. And then task B or activity B it takes 5 days too, but activity D takes 15 days. So the longest path through the project is A, C, and D because that's 30 days in duration. That's our critical path. So if one of those activities gets delayed, it could delay the entire project. The other things you're going to see in each of those rectangles is in the top left, you're going to see the early start, the soonest it could start. In the top right, you're going to see the earliest it could finish. Now, if you go to the bottom, in the middle, you're going to see total float. This tells us how much the, you know, the activity could be delayed without delaying the entire project. And obviously, in the case of the critical path, there's going to be no float. Because if anything gets delayed on that path, the entire project gets delayed. Now, but in the case of activity B, there's a little bit of float there. We can actually get this delayed, or this can be delayed five days, without delaying the entire project. And then what you see on the bottom left and bottom right are late starts and late finish. So any date or any activity with float is going to have a different late start and late finish. Okay, so now let's talk about developing the schedule. Remember, at this point, we're bringing together basically everything that we've already created, our activities, the sequences of those activities, durations, and so on, and putting it together and creating an approved schedule baseline. So here are the tools and techniques as we develop the schedule. There's five of them. There's schedule network analysis, identifying early and late start and finish dates. That's related to this next tool and uh, technique, crit the critical path method. Estimating minimum project duration and the amount of flexibility. We want to understand what our critical path is and where we have flexibility. That's going to be important. Resource optimization. Adjusting activities to ensure resources are appropriately allocated. Obviously, we can't have one resource working on two things full time at the same time. And then schedule compression. Shortening schedule without reducing scope. And sometimes that involves throwing additional resources or money at the problem. And then agile release planning. It's a timeline of the release schedule based on the product roadmap and vision. We're planning agile releases. That could be part of uh, developing the schedule. And here are our outputs. We have a schedule baseline, the approved version of the schedule. It's our authorized plan. And we're going to control changes to that and compare that against actuals. Then we have our project schedule, shows linked activities with dates, durations, milestones, and resources. And in this class, we're going to build that a Microsoft project. And there's schedule data, the information describing and controlling the schedule. This is kind of like what a WBS dictionary is to a WBS. It just gives you useful information and descriptions about uh, the schedule. And then we have project calendars, which is going to identify working days and shifts. It tells us when our team will be working.